Hello everyone. Today we talk about the Visigoths.、Mm, since last time we talked about the Ostrogoths, this seemed、uh, the minimum. And so,、uh, enormously fascinating people, the Visigoths, in Latin known as Visigoti,、um, written either with V or W,、uh, for example, Vesi or Visi,、um, in the same in the same way.、Um, Uh, were this th- the Western branches? Let's put it in this way: of the nomadic tribes of Germanic peoples referred to collectively as the Goths, right? Just for the other video,、uh, as for l- the other video about the Ostrogoths, we won't be making a, a prehistory of these branches, right? Looking at the Goths and how where, where they in the, they came from, etc. And just some hint or reference, right? So, so these tribes as Named as Goths, flourished and spread throughout the late Roman Empire in late antiquity, or what is known as the Migration Era.、Um, and the Visigoths emerged from these earlier Gothic groups, possibly, and I want to stress the possibly、um, the Thervingi, who had invaded the Roman Empire beginning in 376 and had defeated the Romans at the Battle of Adrianople in 378. Famously, and relations between the Romans and Visigothic,、uh, the, the Visigoths were variable、so、o- over time. Alternatively, warring with one another and making treaties when convenient.、Um, the Visigoths invaded Italy, famously also under Alaric the First, and sacked Rome in 410. Right, that was the first sack of Rome after the, the one of the <coughs> of the Gauls, 390. B C, right? So、um, that was a, a very important symbolical event. And after the Visigoths sacked Rome, they began settling down first in southern Gaul and eventually in Hispania.、Um, and it was in the name of the Roman province where they founded the Visigothic kingdom and maintained a presence from the、uh, the fifth century to the the beginning of the eighth century A.D.、Uh, The Visigoths first settled、uh, in southern Gaul as federati to the Romans, right, or of the Romans,、um, a relationship that had been、um, established in 418.、Uh, however, they soon fell out with the Roman hosts, and、um, we will talk more in detail about that later. We, we don't know exactly why, but possibly it's not not even a big deal, given the ambiguity of those political relations. And、uh, the Visigoths established their own kingdom with its capital at Toulouse, in southern、uh, in in southern Gaul. The next、um, step was to extend their authority into Hispania, at the expense of the Suebi and the Vandals that had preceded them. You know, these were populations that had crossed the Rhine at the beginning of fifth century, had gone from the crossed Gaul and settled into into Spain, where, in fact, they. They f- they would be、uh, the Vandals would、mm, go on for for Africa. The Suebi were progressively more or less subdued by the Visigoths, but we'll see it later.、Um, <coughs> and Visigothic rule in Gaul was、um, extended for for a for for a while as well, up to 407 when、um, they were the, the 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 Visigoths were defeated by the Franks under Clovis, who defeated them in fact in the famous battle of Vouillet. And after that, the Visigoth kingdom was limited to Hispania, and just、uh, then, and they never basically、uh, again held territory north of the Pyrenees, except in Septimania. It was this small stripe in southwestern Gaul,、um, <coughs> and hence a small elite group of Visigoths came to dominate the governance of the Iberian Peninsula at the expense of those who had previously ruled there, particularly. In the Byzantine province of Spania and the kingdom of the Suebi, and in or around 589, the Visigoths under Recared the First converted from Arianism to Nicene Christianity, gradually adopting the culture of their Hispano-Roman subjects. Their legal code, the Vis-、uh, code, the Visigothic code. Um, completed in 654, abolished the long-standing practice of applying different laws for Romans and Visigoths. That's very important. We'll see it briefly later, but it has an enormous significance、um, 
as that tells that reveals that the degree of romanization in Visigoths is basically um, that the Visigoths can be mm, concretely conceived as the most intensely romanized Germanic peoples even during the and previously to the this uh, the, the final settlement right in the Iberian Peninsula like once legal distinctions were no longer being made between Romani and Goti, they became known collectively as Hispani in Latin, right? So in the century that followed, the region was dominated by the councils of Toledo, about which I also made a video of the, the early days, maybe I, I will make it, um, and by the episcopacy, and um, we will see eventually the, the importance of this I institution <coughs> Uh, albeit at the detriment of the same Visigothic monarchy in part. Um, and little as else is known actually about Visigothic history during the the 7th century, right? It records are relatively um, sparse, etc. And um, in 711 or 12, an invading force of Arabs and Berbers defeated the Visigoths at the Battle of Guadalete. And their king Roderick and many members of their governing elite were killed. As a consequence, their uh, the Visigothic kingdom rapidly, uh, rapidly collapsed, <coughs> and uh, that's essentially the beginning uh, of the Islamic conquest of Spain. At the same time, of of the Reconquista, if you want, as we will see what what how the thing developed later. And during their governance of Hispania, the Visigoths built several churches, beautiful uh, pieces of early medieval architecture and art that that still survive and they, they also <coughs> and the Visigoths left many artifacts which have been discovered in increasing numbers by archaeologists in relatively recent times in particular uh, the treasure of, of Guarazar of votive crowns and crosses is the most spectacular one um, the gods um, um <coughs> they, 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 they found it uh, only new cities in Western Europe from the, the fall of the Western half of the Roman Empire until the rise of the Carolingian times, right? They, they have this settlement policy that is very interesting from a territorial point of view because controlling the Iberian Peninsula was a big deal, right? It's it's a very difficult thing to do, um, and even more in those times. So this um, <coughs> settlement policies are very, very interesting to, to study, also strategically speaking. Many Visigothic names are still in use in modern Spanish and Portuguese. Hmm? And the, the most notable Visigothic legacy, however, is definitely the Visigothic Code, which served, among other things, as the basis for court procedure um, in most Christian I uh, Iberia until the, the late Middle Ages, um, centuries after the demise of the kingdom, to also to, to, to stress the fact that certain legal codes uh, sometimes are considered as primitive as but actually they were quite functional to certain societies and um <coughs> and this is a testament uh, as they survived for the whole medieval millennium in this case so looking at the etymology of the name and the origin of the uh, visigothic uh, people right so it, it's a bit of a complex picture that we have already partly traced for for the ostrogoths today we focus on the other side um, as um, contemporary re references to the Gothic tribes use the term Besi, which is the Latin for Visigoths, actually, Ostrogoti, Tervingi, and Creutungi. Right? Most scholars have concluded that the terms Besi and Tervingi were both used to refer to one particular tribe, right? while the terms Ostrogoti and Creutungi were used to refer to another, right? especially the Austrian scholar. Herbig Wolfram points out that while primary sources occasionally list all four names, hmm, as in, for example, Grutungi, uh, Austrogoti, Tervingi, Visi, etc., whenever they mention two different tribes, they always refer either to the Vesi and the Ostrogoti or to the Tervingi and the uh, Greutungi, and they, they never pair them up in other combination. Th this conclusion is also supported by uh, Jordanus, the very important uh, source for the uh, for Gothic history has. He was basically a, um, a Byzantine, um, a Gothic Byzantine, right, living in the 6th century. Um, and uh, who identified the Visigoth Vesi 
kings from Alaric the first to Alaric the uh, second as the heirs of the fourth century Thuringian king Athanaric. Mm. While the, the, the Ostrogoth kings from Theoderic the Great to Theodad as the heirs of the Greutungi king Ermanaric. Right. Um, this is important because as we will see it's not completely true or at least uh, we don't know um, precisely. Uh, however, there is a very interesting uh, information contained in the Notitia Dignitatum that actually equates the Vesi with the Thervingi in a reference to the years 388-399, which is particularly interesting because uh, this is when the, the, the Visigoths were fundamentally already within the Empire and also within the Roman army. So mm, that is kind of, uh, of meaningful. And uh, the earliest sources for each of the four names are roughly contemporaneous, uh, con contemporaneous sorry. and the first recorded reference to the Tervingi is an eulogy to the Emperor Ma Maximian, uh, ruling 285-305, uh, delivered in or shortly after 291, perhaps a trier, on April the 20th, uh, 292, uh, and traditionally ascribed to Claudius Mamertinus, who was a an official in the Roman Empire. And it says that the Tervingi uh, I mean, literally, Tervingi, another division of the Goths, in Latin, Tervingi, Pars Alia Gotorum, right? Joined with the Taifali, mm, that were a people, group of either Germanic or Sarmatian origin, to attack the Vandals and the Gepidae, mm, that were two other uh, Germanic uh, peoples, Eastern Germanic peoples. And the term Vandals... By the way, th these were also, you know, the Goths are also classified, of course, as Eastern German. They were the easternmost branch of the Germans in, in the migration here. And the term Vandals, however, in this case, might have been a mistaken reference to the Victoali. Mm? They were a Germanic people, a uh, group of late antiquity. Uh, since around 360, the historian Eutropius um, reports that Dacia was currently inhabited by Taifali, Victoali, and Tervinge, right? So, this is particularly meaningful. And the first recorded reference to the Greutungi instead is by Ammianus Marce Marcellinus, famous, um, prominent Roman soldier and historian. We, we also read him, we were talking about the Battle of Strasbourg from, from his work. Uh, who wrote, writing no earlier than 392 and perhaps later than 395, recounted the words of a Tervingian chieftain was attested as early as 376. Right. The first known use of the term Ostrogoths is in a document dated in September 392 from Milan. Um, in, while Claudian mentions that um, the, the Ostrogoths together with the Grutungi inhabit Frigia, right, so also th this, uh, this in west central part of Anatolia, which is even more interesting because we'll see now what the, the Pontic dimension of the Goths for 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 a while, especially the, however, the, this mainly the Greutungi, um, and Wolfram noted that Vesi and Ostrogoti were terms that each tribe kind of used to boastfully describe itself, right? So these were names that, of course, were a bit like an international. Um, name f using for interacting with uh, either within each other or um, the, the the rest of the world, but of course um, there were many other smaller tribes. As a matter of fact, I, I tend to use the better the term confederation, confederacy, um, when when it takes uh, you know when we talk about chunks like the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, right? Because actually th that's what it was, right? The word um, Germanic peoples were more or less politically. Um, centralized or stratified, and, and particularly the Goths, in my opinion, compared especially to Western Germans, um, that contained lots of other tribes that actually, even when these names were were in use, still kept talking, uh, referring to as themselves, like all other tribes that whose names we have forgotten. I mean, there is massive evidence of that, but for the Alemanni, even for the Anglo-Saxons, so it was perfectly normal. 
And this was ha was happening to the migration here when these populations were on the march. They needed to kind of stick together and to have this to build this um, larger, say, core identity that stressed that their their unity, their role, their cohesion, that everything uh, that, that there was everything out there uh, in the migration era movements, right? Because it's essentially of military needs uh, of cohesion, because otherwise, you know, the the, the, the they were very um, Germanic peoples were actually very homogeneous among each other, uh, and um, and and that the cohesion, national cohesion, was really what made the difference between a people that could survive and crush others, and and the other would would succumb. However, being reabsorbed most of the times into into other um, vanquishing uh, nuclei, right? And uh, so. Uh, the, um, the the Wolfram states, however, that all, uh, while Vesey and Ostrogothi were names used to boastfully describe uh, themselves, it argues instead that Tervingi and Gertungi were geographical identifiers. Each tribe for, used to describe um, the other, right? You know, uh, the, the etymology would be respectfully something, you know, com coming from the forests, since the Tervingi were kind of more northwest in the area of today's Poland, roughly. And the Grotungi were something more in the east, in the Ukrainian steppe, so where the, the etymology would be, well, would be um, actually not of Grotungi, I don't remember, but actually of the kingdom that they found uh, founded there, that the stressing the well watered pastures that, that they found there. So, um, it is it is possible, and um, it 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 actually would fit more or less this this uh, division. But uh, all this is for saying that we are not completely sure whether these groups eventually equated what would become the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths themselves, right? And we'll see it now. Um, and because mm, this. The disappearance of these terms um, occurred after, shortly after 400, when the Goths were displaced by the Hunnic invasions. So the Visigoths, what we call as Visigoths, were already within the empire. The Ostrogoths were under the Huns. So essentially, these names disappear because there was no um, reason to point out the difference between these two blocks as long as they, they didn't live close to each other. So they didn't need to call to distinguish themselves through those names. Um, and as an example of this geographical naming practice, Wolfram cites an account by Zosimus of a group of people lying north of the Danube who called themselves the Scythians, right? But they were called the Greutung by the members of a different tribe living north of the uh, of the Danube, right? So this makes sense. Again, fits with the broader. Um, even idea of what these peoples kind of felt themselves like to be, if, if, you know, especially the eastern um, most uh, area of, um, let's say, groups of the Gothic populations, were objectively at, at great contact and mixing with this Sarmatian populate of the Iranian origin. So the fact of calling themselves the Scythians, there were another people that had been absorbed by the Sarmatians at this point uh, in the area, but, well, yeah, it, it's pretty meaningful in that sense, too. Wolfram, um, however, specifically believes that the people Zosimus describes were those third Vinji who had remained behind after after the Hunnic conquest, right? Zosimus um, lived in, in in basically in, uh, in the in Constantinople during the reign of Eastern Roman Emperor Anastasius. So the the Hunnic um, times had, had were over, right? So this is a, a posteriori consideration. Um, but um, it, it's still meaningful because from this, also Wolfram deduces that the Thervingi actually had remained behind um, uh, when uh, the Hunnic invasions had uh, taken place. They had remained on the western, uh, on the uh, left bank of the Danube, and, and therefore what we call the Visigothi actually wouldn't be um, this people, which instead sometimes we, we tend to, to equate, right? Um, for the most part, all of the terms discriminating between different Gothic tribes gradually disappeared after they moved into the Roman Empire. And this is also a very meaningful 
realization. The last indication that the gods whose king reigned at Toulouse thought themselves as Vesi, right, is found in a panegyric um, on Avitus by uh, Sidonius Apollinaris, dated January the 1st, 456. Mm-hmm. So the Vesi, right, that uh, are more the, the, the thing that the, the Visigoths perceive themselves as, right? We will see also that the same term Visigoth was kind of a Roman invention, right? Or probably the Vesi that probably had had a stronger relation with the Tervingid, but would probably, you know, they, they had kind of detached from or being kind of a, a different uh, unity, uh, maybe since even the beginning, who knows? Um, but this, mm, you know, th- this problems are even devoid. You know, they're not even important by themselves if you think about it. Because what are these groups uh, in practice? How do humans associate in this sense? Most recent scholars, for example, Peter uh, Heather, um, have concluded that Visigothic group identity emerged only within the Roman Empire. In fact, right, um, Collins believes that the Visigothic identity emerged from the Gothic War uh, against the, the the Eastern Roman Empire between uh, 376 and 382, uh, when this collection of uh, Thervingi, Greutungi, and other barbarian contingents banded together in multi-ethnic federati, right? So uh, th- this. Uh, groups uh, that uh, bound by a treaty known as the Fetus with Rome, and that were, however, like peoples in arms, right? As a migrate, uh, as a migration, f- migrating formation under Alaric the First, right? In the Eastern Balkans, uh, since they had become a multi-ethnic group, and could no longer claim to be exclusively Turbinged. So this is also very interesting. Um, statement because it stresses the fact that also these groups that are at cross trying to escape uh, Hunnic uh, domination, Hunnic pressure um, were fundamentally um, also probably there was a political turmoil within the this, this same Gothic um, you know um, uh, groups, even the, the this westernmost ones uh, in what today roughly be the, the the counter of Romania, right? Um, so that we would cross were, you know, different groups together that maybe didn't uh, hadn't had a, a pre-existing cohesion uh, in in the process. Always think that these groups rarely moved like in one block. They were all scattered um, clans that um, kind of autonomously. Uh, found their, their their way into you know territories uh, that could be inhabited or not, and that would would have also the, their maybe a stronger attachment, in fact, to the clan, to the tribe, to the confederation, and such. Um, the term Visigoth was an invention of the sixth century. This is also very important. Cassiodorus, that is you know this uh, Roman statement famous, renowned scholar of antiquity, writer in the administration of Theodoric the, the Great, king of, of the Ostrogoths at the time of the Gothic do- domination of Italy, invented the term Visigothic, historiographically, to match that of Ostrogothic, right, that, that probably, as we've seen with the Ostrogothi, Austrogothi, depending on what was named, was an actual name, uh, like the Vesi, right, uh, that objectively stresses the, east, the, the the character of the eastern side of the story, like, but in in a, in a I think um, yeah, implicitly geographic, but also much semantically richer way. Like these weren't like the eastern gods simply, but they were, as I mentioned in the in the last video about them, um, the the gods blessed by the rising sun, right? Also, in fact, the most successful. The most successful ones we had before the Hunnic invasions had established a very prosperous kingdom into uh, today's uh, Ukraine and Crimea, um, and um, the um, so 
it, it was easy to say, okay, well, this resounds also even etymologically the East, so let's call those gods that at that point were instead settled in Spain, so west of, of Italy, the Western gods, right? And so, hence, Visigoths, Western gods, and Eastern gods, respectively, but it's a Roman invention. Right, the Western Eastern division was a simplification, a literary device, if you if you want, of sixth century Roman historians. Um, while political realities were way more complex than these, and sometimes they escape our understanding, both previously but also during these kingdoms, because, frankly, you know, um, aside from the Romanization, it was the biggest uh, deal at this point. Uh, from a political point of view for them, um, uh, still probably th these groups had lacked, as we've seen before, a true national cohesion uh, at the beginning, like at least in the way we intended. Th this were, especially during the, the phase of the migration, these populations would basically absorb lots of other groups that would even join them willingly to, to, to follow the migration, hoping to get new land in the process, right? Um, I mean, the Ostrogothic migration in Italy was a big thing. The Visigothic w was a different one, was also big, but it was kind of more... Um, uh, was was happening within a, a more controlled way from, from the Roman side, so it's also more interesting to see, and that brought, in fact, to their greater degree of Romanization. Um, that, however, shouldn't be overly stressed in absolute terms, uh, not even for the Visigoths, even if they are the most Romanized ones. Um, and eventually, um, also further, actually, uh, Cassiodorus used the term Goths to refer only to the Ostrogoths. This, this is particularly interesting. So even, you know, th there's even this idea of lesser thing, because objectively at the time, the Ostrogothic kingdom was th the most powerful polity in there, and also extending uh, its um, um, control, uh, political control over the, the Visigothic one at one point. Um, so uh, the the Ostrogoths would be the Goths, right, the most, and, and the others, you know, the, the geographical term was reserved Visigoths for the Gallo Spanish Goths at the time. Um, and this usage, however, was adopted by the Visigoths themselves, especially in their communications with the Byzantine Empire. In fact, uh, this was still in use in the, in the 7th century when the Ostrogoths had disappeared, right? So basically, um, you know, they uh, this also speaks about the, the, the Romanization of the gods, that they preferred to, to use even a Roman historiographical invention to term themselves um, in, in a diplomatic diplomatic seat with, with Constantinople that would have, this is rarely stressed, but had an enormous impact also in the political development of the Visigothic kingdom proper in Spain, and even for the councils of Toledo, etc. Uh, other names for the Gothic divisions abounded a Germanic, Byzantine, or Italian author referred to one of the two peoples as the Balagoti, meaning Roman gods, right? Because uh, Bala, in, in in German, is the name reserved to the the foreigners, um, and and it was a name that even gives to you know that you can still be found. For example, the the modern region of Valachia. Uh, in Romania, takes the na name from there because that was the most intensely, uh, intensely Latinized area. Uh, the Germans who settled in Carpathian Bays and um, um, heard this, these people speaking differently from the other Germanic populations who surrounded them, and hence Valach, right? So the fact that the Visigoths were also known as Valagothi by this either Germanic or Italian say, Byzantine author means that these were so. Um, even kind of different for being Germans, for being Goths, you know, because they were so intensely Romanized that this foreign character um, was maintained, right? Um, and there, there was also a, a, a strong emphasis at one point, even uh, relatively to the um, to the dynastic character of this um, Gothic group, uh, since in 469 the Visigoths were called the Alaric gods, right? Alaric's gods. Uh, so stressing the importance of the uh, Baldi dynasty that had ruled with, you know, Alaric the first, Al uh, that had marched on Rome. Like it, that is an important thing for for the gods and had an extreme pride in this sense. But or already stressing with this idea of Roman gods, the Alaric gods, which means you know the gods of a king, 
that their th this Germanic political uh, group had quite transformed over time from the original ethnic political culture that is theoretically egalitarian, is theoretically you know all about uh, we can't say Germanism in itself, but it is still is something separated from the Romans. And of, objectively, the Goths did remain separated from Rome. I don't want to stress the thing that they were all one, you know, because sometimes you hear the simplifications, like, ah, oh, the Germans were so so Romanized, after all, they, they were kind of uh, like all the other Romans. No, it wasn't quite like that. I mean, in certain cases, yes, especially in the events of, you know, small groups, small bands, but when you see this Federati uh, literally entering as the Visigoths did first and all the other Germans in t within the Roman um, territory as a unique people that still responds to their own kingdom, that may be uh, you know, a Roman commander appointed, you know, whatever you want, but they're still a different people, they can of course be exposed to Romanic, uh, to, to Roman culture and to Romanize, which did happen pretty massively for in the case of the Visigoths in particular, but still they were something different, right? They didn't they were kind of an anomaly still. And that's also important fact to, to see uh in the Theodosian um political and military so solutions that were adopted for them that also reveals however a good disposition from the, the the German side to you know to cope to cooperate with the Romans, right? Um Talk, um, talking about the, the strict etymology of the term Tervingi and Vesi slash Visigothi uh, from a Germanic base. Uh, so the, the name Tervingi may, may mean forest people, right? Uh, th this hypothesis would be supported by evidence that geographic descriptors were commonly used to distinguish people living north of the Black Sea, both before it uh, an after Gothic settlement there um, by evidence of forest related names among the Tervingi, for example, and by the lack of uh, evidence for an earlier date for the name of the pair Tervingi Greutungi, then the late third century, where when the Goths in fact stretched from the the Baltic Sea the, um, to to the Black Sea. Um, and as I was saying before, you know, the Tervingi in the sense would have been those who covered roughly today's uh, Poland, uh, that was, uh, of course, and partly today as well, the forest, quite forested area, um, and um, therefore that's that's um, realistic. And also, it's interesting that this, the, 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 even the uh, the names of these people would reflect etymologically this, uh, you know, proximity to this world you know, nature characterized by the forest, right? It is very different from the one of the steppe, for example. Um, and it changes a lot of things in, se in terms of settlement of culture, even on other peoples, if anything, from, from the geographical location of, I mean, the neighbors, etc. Um, and, and so this also tells you, however, that these uh, groups were r relatively new, right? These weren't pre-existing groups, you know, talking about the gods proper, yeah, uh, we have difficulties even to to tell where they actually came from. Um, it, there is not a clear ev uh, evidence of that, especially in this eastern area. Um, it, it's perfectly plausible that the gods actually came from Scandinavia. They did less, oh, the other, many other Germanic peoples, you know, landed in Central Europe, then went across and. Um, um, integrated all these other populations, but in, in the case of the gods, it seems that especially this last uh, passage it was um, characterized by a, a much greater uh, inclusiveness of many other uh, ethnic groups, especially of Sarmatian origin, that um, at one point um, uh, they became Germans uh, ethnically, hence juridically, um, so they they decided to share this Germanic political uh, identity, but um, they um, they were already kind of you know free elements on their own. Probably there wasn't literally any direct uh, and brutal conquest, but it was a, an assimilation, a, a blending. Right? We we know very few about these things, but it's possible. Right? Not that it was all kind of peaceful, of course. It was it was violent as well, but 
such free associations kind of happen more frequently than than what violence uh, does. So that that's important. And in any case, we know that the the the, the gods in general were, for example, the peoples that um, developed the most the equestrian zoot uh, technique. Um, know how of the step that 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 evidently were more influenced by those populations uh and the gods were also many right so it's it, it's quite unlikely that at the time you know they overly expanded just because of increase of birth rate of fertility of whatever you know they, they obviously expanded like much of other demographic expansions of the time just because they integrated other peoples right which is very different from um, the, the name Tervingi has pre-Pontic and possibly even Scandinavian origins, right? It, it's a valid, you know, um, a hypothesis accepted today that they they might have uh, this name was within it was given within a linguistically uh, uh, dominant Germanic uh, context. Uh, the Visigoths are called Vesi or Visi by Trebellius Pollio, um, Claudian, and Sidonius Apollinaris. And the word is Gothic for good, right? Implying the good or worthy people. Related to the Gothic uh, Yuzitsa, which means better, and a reflex of the Indo European Vesu. Uh, that means uh, good, uh, akin to the Welsh Gwyd, uh, which means excellent, or the the Hellenic Eus, which means good. Sanskrit Vasu uh, means good as well. It's the same etymology, if, if I'm not wrong, of wise, right? So th it, it's not truly goodness in the, in the sense we mean it, like, oh, these were good people, like, no, good in, in this Germanic um, context meant like first of all, wise, which was a title given especially to great chief to older to elder chieftains that had great kingdoms that they preferred to maintain more with you know kind of a clever politics than just with arms. That is something that just young people, young warriors have to prove their value have to do, but that also brings promise. So this goodness that implies uh, wisdom and um, still a military power in this sense and not just a, a peaceful or you know uh, you understand in a uh, in a behavioral sense you know still uh, a, a, a valid excellent in fact um, worthy also so they deserve more theoretically in fact the gods had this quite strong sense especially I think the Ostrogoths but the Visigoths probably shared this as well in part um, this this great sense of themselves. I mean, before the Hunnic invasions, objectively, the Gothic confederacies had reached a, a, a great level of development um, in the Ukraine, especially this partly, you know, literacy in part, uh, pr and probably um, they got Christianized. Right, the Goths were a Germanic people of old Christianization, and also Christianized other populations like the Longobards, for example, uh, as Aryans, though. Right, so not as Catholics. But eventually they would grow. So that, that in the case of the gods, that uh, especially in the case of the Visigoths, the the religious policy is probably one of the single most in interesting to follow in the Germanic, the various Germanic um, histories, single Germanic histories. And Jordanus relates the tribe's name to a river, though this is most likely a folk etymology or legend, like his similar story about the Greutung name. Right, so this more than telling us that the etymology might have been related to a river, if anything tells us historically that these peoples were settled al along important rivers, like like just like the Dnest or the Dnieper, uh, um, and um, in in this um, southeastern, like uh, Eastern European um, areas. So, as we've seen, um, the Visigoths emerged from the Gothic tribes, most likely a derivative name from the Gutones, mm -hmm. uh, a people uh, believed to have their origins in Scandinavia, and who migrated uh, southeastwards sorry, into Eastern Europe. Such understanding of their origins is largely the result of Gothic traditions, and their true genesis as a people is as obscure as that of the Franks and the Alamanni. 
Um, I would say even more than them, because actually about the Franks and the Alamanni, we, we kind of know where they emerged from. They emerged from roughly, the Franks respectively, from the north, northwestern Germanic tribes, or roughly the, the same ones who crushed the, the, uh, the Roman legions at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. The Alamanni were Elbe Germans, um, coming probably from, from the Swabic uh, Confederation, uh, and in fact that's the same name why they, they, they might, you know, they, they modern southwestern German region still bore the name of Swabia, like even if there, there were Alamanni settling there, and that also tells you about how the, the names they used were kind of um, generic. I mean, Franks and Al Alamanni are typical names, respectively, meaning free and old men, like meaning stressing this freedom card. The case of the Goths is, is different, because the Goths, as we've just said, have traveled uh, more far away, um, and they probably assimilated much more um, allergen elements than, than these populations in the western branch. Um, and especially, uh, the same Romans contributed to, uh, to, to, mm, to fabricate um, a kind of, um, um, let's say, a, a noble um, past uh, of these peoples, especially in Ostrogothic Italy, that uh, you know had all these elegies towards uh, Theodoric, the greatness of the gods, and how good they were as fighters, etc. So uh, the same Romans kind of built up the the origin of the gods as a kind of a dating their origins so straight to Scandinavia, which w uh, at the time was it, it was perfectly plausible history, and still is historically speaking, but. Uh, just because all the other Germans seemingly had come from there, but when it comes to the Gothic ethnogenesis, it seems that it was much more. Um, it came from much more heterogeneous elements. But even the Roman historiography wanted to um, to call the Goths like you know even you know you know that even the concept of Germans or Celts it seems to be uh, in a certain sense a conventional way of reference that the same. Uh, well, the Celts disappeared uh, at one point, but the, the 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 Germans themselves embraced once they they settled into former Roman territory and they kind of accepted through Latinization um, to to perceive themselves as Germani, right? As so as this name that the Romans had given to them, they probably didn't quite um, share, like they didn't quite uh, really have or, or conceive, like they. The Germans probably had an idea of themselves like um, a pretty regional, even provincial one, for which, yeah, there were all these peoples around, but they didn't know excessively much about the rest of the world up to a certain time. So uh, they didn't need to call themselves as something different compared to something that they didn't even know that was there, right? So they hadn't developed that kind of identity. They perceived themselves as similar and they shared the language, customs, b beliefs, etc. But eventually they came to rationalize that just mostly during the migration era and thanks to the connection with the Romans. In the case of the Goths, they were the most intensely Romanized, as we've seen, is, is more emblematic, right? For which um, a history of the God, uh, uh, of the Gothic people was, was fabricated uh, within um, the, Roman, uh, the Roman Empire. At the point, um, they, they started kind of, in part, believing it on their own, right, as well. And, um, although, of course, um, actually, to counter this, this statement, you could simply say that um, there is a coherency, um, a coherence into the general picture that we get, also from other, in, in an, with an analogy to other Germanic peoples, to the fact that yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at it from a geographical point of view, we know that the gods roughly gravitated like the Gutones uh, around the Scandinavian um, this Tule, this, this great north then eventually followed the, the Vistula that they landed on the cen uh, central Europe they followed the Vistula river and they arrived the Carpathians and from there in the east to the Ukraine, I mean it's perfectly coherent so uh, even this, there has been a tendency to overstress the fact that we don't know where the real origins of these peoples but if you really look at it, even in the case of the gods um, the world story is pretty, pl pretty plausible, right? But we shouldn't think in that sense that it was particularly clear to the same gods themselves, which is always something one has to 
uh, realized that these peoples had kind of uh, they know surely uh, they knew their past surely better than we do but not necessarily about things that we are most more concerned of right but who knows and um, so the Visigoths spoke an Eastern Germanic language that was distinct by the 4th century. Eventually the Gothic language died as a result of contact with the European people during the Middle Ages. Hmm. Um, it sounds bad, like with the people that roughly, yeah, in, in Southern Europe, chiefly Romance languages that absorbed them. And um, and long struggles between the neighboring Vandili, that would be, uh, and, and, and Lu Lugi, or Lugi in classical pronunciation, with the Goths, might have contributed to their earlier exodus into mainland Europe, right? You know that um, in this kind of mythical past there are these uh, figures that even correspond to single heroes, you know, the Vinil and Vandil. Um, the Vandals and the Lugi seems to have been actually the same people. Right, they inhabited roughly the area of Poland. So at one point, these peoples must have been in, uh, entered in contact with the gods and clashed, um, and um, and indeed the, the gods were li more likely way more powerful than them. Probably crushed them. So it's um, it, it's very interesting to to make this confrontation. That's but you can already see here that when it takes with the when we talk about the Mandals and the Luji, for example. Uh, because we think that the Lugi were these people that eventually evolved into the Vandals, right? A bit like those uh, Franks and Alemanni evolved from what we said from northwestern Germanic tribes and, respect and the Swabic Confederation uh, tri tribes, in respectively. And we think the Lugi weren't even Germans, right? And and uh, or maybe they were they were uh, Celtic or Celtic at the beginning, um, and uh, mixed eventually with Germans, probably also with Proto Slavs. It's very likely that the Vandals already had a kind of a, you know consistent Slavic element within them, so you you already understand that the Goths were venturing into a kind of a frontier area of the same Germanic tribes and immediately interacting with people who were um, kind of mm, kind of different uh, in 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 by a certain degree, and these clashes might have triggered their own their own migration at one point. Um, in fact, it was normally like this. I mean, the whole migra deal of the migration here was to find new land somewhere to leave and to have, you know, to prosper there. And the gods achieved that, like settling into, especially in the Ukraine, that they, they got an enormous power. And these other groups from which we think is that Visigothic um, branch stamped seemingly followed a more continental route from today's Poland to roughly today's Romania, right, to, from which they eventually poured into what would be today's Bulgaria, and therefore at the time within the Roman Empire. Um, the vast majority um, of the gods had, uh, at the beginning, probably settled between the Oder and Vistula rivers, until our population according to the, the same Gothic legends or tribal sagas, forced them to move south and east, right, when where they settled just north of the Black Sea, as we've seen. Um, and however, this legend is not supported by archaeological evidence. So its validity is disputable, but, you know, um, we're, it's very rare, objectively, to have a direct evidence of that, because if history doesn't tell us Archaeology doesn't tell us either, because in the area everybody was so homogeneously in terms of ma homogeneous in terms of material culture that um, you can't tr you can't tag these guys. There is no way to understand who was who there. But this still doesn't invalid. It's not a proof against, right? Uh, historian Malcolm Todd, for example, contends that while this large and mass migration is possible, the movement of Gothic peoples southeast was more likely the result of warrior bands moving closer to the wealth of the Ukraine and the cities of the Black Sea coast, which is perfectly plausible, uh, but doesn't, of course, invalidate the idea. So this myth of the Great Migration for many other peoples, you know, is 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 gray is is partly. Um, incorrect or maybe not well described in the sense that um, of course at one point such peoples put themselves on the march like look about look at the, the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths within the Roman Empire 
but that's another story. When they were out there in the Barbaricum, they found this extreme political uh, instability and fragmentation all around. The way they would move was not like the wall people, you know, making 100 kilometers at a time, but you know, uh, in 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 one month, but uh, doing like uh, that in one century because all these small bands would move, would move spontaneously, right? And this naturally increases also the, uh, you know, the, the, the mix with, with the locals, we, we, would they meet, right? And, and this is very meaningful as the Germans went marching, these gods went marching to territories that weren't Germanic. And that's what favored also the integration as a result. And perhaps what is most notable about the Gothic people in this regard was that by the middle of the 3rd century AD they were the most formidable military power beyond the lower Danube frontier. Objectively, as we will see now, the Goths were the most powerful um, Germanic entity and also caused a lot of problems on the Romans and the, uh, to the Romans on the Danubian frontier for, for a long time. Throughout the 3rd and 4th centuries, in fact, there were numerous conflicts and exchanges of varying types between the Goths and their neighbors. After the Romans withdrew from the territory of Dacia, the local population was subjected to constant invasions by the migratory tribes, and among the first being the Goths. In uh, 238, the Goths invaded across the Danube into the Roman province of Mesia, hmm, on the Danube, um, in today, between today's uh, Romania and Bulgaria, uh, pillaging and exacting payment through hostage taking. Uh, during the war with the Persians, uh, the Theard Goths also appeared in the Roman armies of Gordian the Third, which is very meaningful because when you find these Goths, you never think that they were just enemy of the Romans. They 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 were simply they were mercenaries, right? They sold their services at the best uh, best uh, of offer. And it was full of Germanic mercenaries into Roman service, even way before, I mean two centuries before, like in this case, the Battle of uh, Adrianop, which was, per was perfectly normal. Like one of the best thing you could do as a, as a young German warrior was to, to, to be enlisted into the Roman army at the time. And maybe coming back home when you were done with the service, right? Um, it was great, you know, well paid, uh, best army in the world out there. Um, yeah, you could make a fort, you could even Romanize and settle down within, within the empire. It did happen a lot of times. Um, and when subsidies to the gods were stopped from Rome, the gods organized uh, uh, and in 250 joined a major barbarian invasion led by the Germanic king Cneva. Success on the battlefield against the Romans inspired additional invasions. Uh, into the northern Balkans and deeper into Anatolia. Mm. Um, starting in approximately 255, the Goths even added a new dimension to their attacks by taking to the sea and invading harbors, which brought them into conflict with um, the, the, the Atlantic dimension as well, the empire. Um, the, the city of uh, Pythias, for example, fell to the Goths in 256. Um, uh, in which further emboldened them. Sometime between 266 267, the Goths raided Greece, but when they attempted to move into the Bosphorus Straits to attack Byzantium, they were repulsed. Hmm? Um, along with the other Germanic tribes, the Goths attacked further into Anatolia, assaulting Crete and Cyprus on the way. Shortly thereafter, they pillaged Troy and the temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Right, this is very important because there is a uh, the Goths were pirates, right? Um, they were a naval power now, but controlling the great rivers of of of, of Eastern Europe and having considerable even wealth and uh, and capacity and of pro of projection at that point. And there were a great problem in the Eastern Mediterranean, in, in the Black Sea, as, as we understand. And throughout the reign of Emperor Constantine the Great, the, Wi the Visigoths continued to, uh, ra to raid on Roman territory south of Danube River. Right, so crossing. And by 332, relations between the Goths and the Romans were stabilized by a treaty uh, that, however, was not to last. Um, so, 
coming to this crucial moment into Roman and, and Gothic history uh, as well, Germanic history as well, the Goths remained, um, you know, the, the war, with, the Great War with Rome, the Gothic War of 376, 382. So in here, the Goths remained in Dacia until 376, when one of their leaders, Fridigern, appealed to the Roman Emperor Valens to be allowed to settle with his people on the south bank of the Danube. Here they hoped, hoped to find a refuge from the Huns. Valens permitted this as he saw uh, in them a splendid uh, recruiting ground for the, his army. However, a famine broke out and Rome was unwilling, unwilling to supply them with either the food they were promised or the land. Generally, the Goths were abused by the Romans, who began forcing the now starving Goths to trade away their children, so as to stave off starvation. As a consequence, open revolt ensued, leading to six years of plundering throughout the Balkans, the death of a Roman emperor, and a disastrous defeat of the Roman army. Now, this tells uh, us so much about uh, Roman policy at the time, chiefly the fact that the Germans were used to uh, be settled by the Romans within their borders, which was a policy that the Romans basically had uh, always enacted since a very long time. Uh, and that had gone pretty well uh, up to that point because, um, you know, th these groups were la rarely, um, um, you know, cohesive and strong. You know, the, 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 the great Germanic confederations started appearing from just from the second half of the second century, and also they, they weren't a big deal after all for the Roman army. Now, a lot of things had happened, including um, demographic economic crisis of the empire from the within, so these peoples were starting to be kind of more difficult to handle, but still it was feasible. And here, Balance uh, deci had decided to the Vis had allowed to the Visigothic uh, refugees who were fleeing from the, the Hunnic invasions to settle into Roman territory because, okay, um, they can work for the army. Everything was regulated by Roman authority, as, and we know here, in fact, they were corrupted enough that they exploited these peoples that tried to, in fact, to, 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 to arrest them, to, to sell, take them prisoner, to sell them as slaves. Um, it was usual business in, in the Roman world at this point as this uh, peoples could be, in fact, uh, abused in this sense. They, they could be taken and uh, deployed where they, they wanted, either in small or larger groups, right? Um, the Battle of Adrianople in 378 uh, AD was the, the decisive moment of this situation, right? Uh, the Roman, to make a long story short, the Roman forces were slaughtered and the Emperor Valens was killed during the fighting, right? Uh, it was a kind of a, also mythical story because precisely how Valens fell remains uncertain, right? But Gothic legend tells uh, how the emperor was taken to a farmhouse which was set on fire above his head, um, a tale made more popular by its symbolic representation of a heretical emperor receiving hell's torment as Valens was an Aryan himself. This was a moment in which the, the Roman, uh, especially the Eastern Roman Empire, flowed into the you know, the Catholic or Aryan, you know, thing, and Valens had at least sympathies for Arianism, had been um, baptized uh, by a Ar Ar Arian bishop, etc. Uh, and the the point, though, you know, the Battle of Adrianople, it's enough, uh, it's important to spend um, some word about this, because Adrianople represents, uh, like, a, a very important um, um, event that objectively uh, was to trigger other events in turn that would quite late determine definitely the end of the West, right? Uh, the Battle of Adrianople, however, in itself didn't actually cause any major um, collapse of the Empire. Uh, absolutely not. I mean, the, the immediate consequences were uh, took the Romans to to absorb part of their resources, etc. But they weren't they weren't disasters at all. Adrianople is not the beginning of the end, uh, as it's often said. Quite easily, uh, the Visigoths, for for example, could be literally wiped out 
uh, very easily at the beginning of the 5th century without any problem by the Romans. They didn't happen for political uh, decision of the Romans themselves. Um, the um, even the the same uh, you know the the Majorianus reconquest, which is often overlooked at one point, you know, could perfectly re reintegrate uh, the Visigoths who were settling um, in uh, in across the Pyrenees at one point because they didn't have much of a strength on their own at that point. You know, all the West was exhausted, including the Germans inhabited there just because the Vandals put themselves in in the middle and defeated the Romans. The Visigoths also kind of you know, lived on. Um, so, actually, the, the, there is no deterministic uh, approach for which, you know, you could say that Adrianople uh, was the cause of the fall of the Western Roman Empire. It's completely false, historically speaking. And also, its effects have always been, often been magnified, you know. Um, the, uh, you know, of course, um, many of Rome's leading officers and some of their most elite fighting men died during the battle, which struck a major blow to Roman prestige, especially in the empire's military capabilities in, in the very short run. Adrianople shocked the Roman world and eventually forced the Romans to negotiate with and settle the tribe uh, within the empire's boundaries, a development with far-reaching consequences, right? Um, but for the Roman soldier um, and, and historian Ammianus Marcellinus even ends his uh, chronology of Roman history with this battle in a very dark way, if you think about it. But it, to look, looking at this historical perspective, despite the severe consequences for Rome, Adrianople was not nearly as productive overall for the Visigoths, for example, and, and their gains were very short-lived. Um, still confined to a small and relatively impoverished province of the empire, Strace was, uh, another Roman army was being gathered against him. An army which also had amid its ranks other disaffected gods, I ironically enough. And intense campaigns against the Visigoths followed their victory at Adrianople for upwards of, of three years. Approach routes across the Danube provinces were effectively sealed off by concerted Roman efforts, and while there was no decisive victory to claim, it was essentially a Roman triumph ending in a treaty in 382. The treaty struck with the gods was to able the first fedus on imperial Roman soil. It required these semi-autonomous Germanic tribes to raise troops for the Roman army in exchange for arable land and freedom from Roman legal structures within the empire. Um, in, in, in the perspective, in the political propaganda of the new emperor Theodosius I, the, this um, treaty was uh, an apotheosis, like it was uh, a moment of, of, uh, of great, um, you know, success for the empire that had managed fundamentally, according to this picture, to 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 civilize these terrible uh, barbarians and making them become uh, you know uh, civilized uh, you know peaceful Roman let's say peaceful peasants right on Roman soil uh, reality was different after all but if you look even at uh, the Battle of the Frigidus River uh, to which also the Visigoths as now we will see participated well it's fundamentally difficult to to see in in, in, in the battle of, of, of the um, invasion of the Visigoths in, in Thrace, a, a moment in which the, the Romans couldn't react militarily to this, as the Goths were immediately uh, enlisted into the Roman army, th they paid a, a very uh, heavy toll of blood for Rome, um, and Rome kept fighting against uh, herself actually during civil wars with massive armies were larger than the ones that had been defeated at Adrianople one against the other so this is the proof of how uh, relative actually the impact of Adrianople in itself and not just by the consequences that were completely relative at that point and uh, the way they could happen um, then th th that is often told but at this point it's worthy to talk about the figure of Alaric um, 
the first that is regarded basically as you know the, the most if not the most um um you know the, the greatest in absolute terms i mean as a leader of uh, as a ruler of a kingdom like other later visigothic kings would be but however is definitely the, the most important king of the visigoths he also because he f it was the first one right from 395 to 410 um uh, he was son or paternal grandson of chieftain rotestus He's best known for his sack of Rome in 410, which marked an important event in the decline of the Western Roman Empire. It had a, a huge symbolic impact, as we will see now. And Alaric began his career under the Gothic soldier Gainus, right? And later, you know, he, he was a, a Gothic leader who served the Eastern Roman Empire as Magister Militum the, during the reigns of Theodosius and Arcadius, right? And, and later, Alaric joined the Roman army. Um, he first appeared as leader of a mixed band of Goths and allied peoples who invaded Thrace in 391, so actually later than um, the Adrianople, um, but were stopped by the half-Vandal Roman general Stilicho, hmm? a very famous uh, figure of his times, was this high-ranking general in the Roman army who became for a time the most powerful men in Western Roman Empire. He was half Vandal and married to a niece of Emperor Theodosius I, right? Uh, you know, uh, the, the, his regency for the underage Honorius marked uh, the, the, the high point uh, in, uh, of, a, of Germanic advancement in the service of Rome, right? And we will see now. So, what, what his uh, story is that is pretty uh, extraordinary. And. Um, the in, in 394, Alaric led a Gothic force of 20,000 that helped the Roman Emperor Theodosius uh, defeat the Frankish usurper Arbogast after the Battle of Frigidus, of the Frigid River, uh, despite sacrificing around 10,000 of his men. Right, that's the heavy toll of blood and more than the gods paid for Roman armies, basically being stashi stationed in every single uh, corner of the empire. Uh, Alaric received little recognition from the emperor and disappointed, he left the army um, and was elected reix uh, of, of the, the, the Visigoths in 395. Um, Reich is a Gothic title. It's, it's like um, Reich. That, that would be the same etymology. The Gothic title for a tribal ruler, often translated as king, it means um, Reich as powerful, as you know, as um, so power because you know that Germanic political culture distrusts monarchies. Uh, right, but in practice, well, these were first. Uh, they, they were monarchs on their own, but they were considered as first among equals that were legitimated, especially um, for military uh, purposes by the, the people as a well whole to to lead them to to victory. Um, in this happened in 395, um, after which. Alaric marched towards Constantinople until he was diverted by Roman forces, and he then moved southward into Greece, where he sacked the Piraeus, that is the port of Athens, and destroyed Corinth, Megara, Argos, and Sparta. Nonetheless, the Eastern Roman uh, Emperor Arcadius appointed Alaric Magister Militum, which is, means the master of the soldiers, um, in Illyricum. So in this area that the the gods had been inhabiting now within within the Roman borders, and in four uh, hundred and one, Alaric invaded Italy, but was defeated by Stilicho at the Battle of Pollentia, the modern Pollenza, on April sixth, four hundred and two, and a second invasion that same year also ended in the defeat at the Battle of Verona, although he did force the Roman Senate to pay a large subsidy to the Visigoths. During Radagasius' Italian invasion of 406, this was another Gothic uh, king who led an invasion of, uh, you know, at, at this point, and, he, and Alaric remained idle in Lyria. 
Um, and, and this we can imagine all the political calculations in here now it's actually a very complicated period now we are just presenting it in a very concise way but just for the sake of chronicle chron but um, it, it's actually a very complicated picture about which also we know a, a relatively few this was a moment in which the Visigoths also risked to be wiped out um, you know that's how um, dangerous they were but all at the same time also um, you know the, everything could go seriously wrong after these two first defeats right the, the 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 Roman army could have marched them and at one point they were trapped, but Stilicho had decided to let him go because he hoped he could use them as his own troops and to to even gain more power I into the west and that that's why they, they weren't they lived on right uh in four hundred oh uh, in 408, a Western Emperor Honorius ordered the execution of Stilicho and his family in, in response to rumors that the general had made a deal with Alaric, in fact. Uh, this was the Western uh, anti-Germanic um, reaction uh, that, however, backfired, as we'll see now, while in the East this would be successful at the end of the day. Not that Germans were eliminated, actually they kept remaining in some of the most important, especially military offices of the Empire, but still the East mm, had a better metabolism of these elements. The West was too weak at this point to, uh, and some, some, somewhat incompetent on, on, some, on some, some occasion to deal effectively with the, this presence. Um, Honorius uh, in fact, in the uh, Western Roman Emperor incited the Roman population to massacre tens of thousands of wives and children of federati Goths serving in the Roman military. Right? Uh, just think of what it means. Uh, and the Gothic settlers then defected to Alaric, increasing the size of his force to around 30,000 men, and joined his march on Rome to avenge their murdered families. Uh, and moving swiftly along Roman roads, Alaric sacked the cities of Aquileia and uh, Cremona and ravaged the lands along the Adriatic Sea. The Visigothic leader thereupon laid siege to Rome in 408, but eventually the Senate granted him a substantial subsidy, and in addition he forced the Senate to liberate all 4,000 Gothic slaves in Rome. Honorius, however, refused to appoint Alaric as the commander um, uh, of the Western Roman army, uh, as it had asked. And in, in 409, the Visigoths again surrounded Rome. Alaric lifted his blockade after pro proclaiming Attalus Western Emperor. Uh, Attalus appointed his magister Utriusque Militia, which means master of both services, but refused to allow him to send any um, uh, any troops, an, an army actually, into Africa. And negotiations with Honorius broke down, after which Alaric deposed Attalus in the summer of 410 and besieged Rome for the third time. And allies within the capital opened the gates for him on August the 24th, and for three days his troops sacked the city. Although the Visigoths plundered Rome, they treated its inhabitants humanly and burned only a few buildings, and having abandoned a plan to occupy Sicily and North Africa after the destruction of his fleet in a storm, Alaric died as the Visigoths were marching northward. Um, the the interest of, of these Germans for, for Sicily and North Africa would, w was immense because those were the grain uh, reservoirs of the Western uh, Roman Empire. That gap would be filled by the Vandals later on, which is also f fascinating to think, uh, as the Vandals were in Africa now, uh, excuse me, in Spain now, and, and uh, um, they, um, they would be dislodged by the same Visigoths uh, at one point. Um, and this, the figure of Alaric is is very fascinating, and uh, there is all the mythology around him. He, you know, we could go a bit more in detail. For example, he was born on the Pauta Island, on the mouth of the Danube Delta in present-day Romania. Right, he belonged to the noble Balti dynasty of the Turvingian gods. 
um, the Balti mean, meaning bold, etymologically speaking, this uh, important uh, dynasty, as we've seen uh, already. And, and the Goths suffered setbacks against the Huns, made a mass migration across the Danube, as we've seen, and that's what led them to fight with Rome. And in this period, Alaric was probably a child, right? So even think about this generationally speaking, and what what it means to be Alaric, what, what it means to have lived um, in in your past, in your childhood, and what this the the the, the, the reasons of these peoples were, right? Uh, the in 394, Alaric um, served as a leader of the Federati under Theodosius the First in the campaign which crushed the usurper Arbogast, right? Um, as a battle of the Frigidus which terminated this campaign was fought at the passes of the Julian Alps, probably Alaric learned the weakness of Italy's natural defenses in its northeastern frontier and uh, at the head of the Adriatic Sea where he would cross in fact with his, with his army later on. And Theodosius died in 395 leaving the empire to be divided between his two sons, Arcadius and Honorius, uh, the former taking the eastern and the latter the western portion of the empire. As we have seen, Arcadius showed little interest in ruling, leaving most of the actual power to his Praetorian prefect Rufanus, and Honorius was still a minor. Um, as his guardian, Theodosius had appointed the Magister Militum Stilico, hence how he had, and Stilico had claimed um, 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 you know, also the, the be the guardian of Arcadius, causing much rivalry between the Western and Eastern courts. Right, they we're starting to behave like a, two different states. After Theodosius is, is the last one, uh, last emperor that ever ruled over the, the two halves re reunite, and according to, of course, ser several authors, um, uh, the, the during the shifting of offices that took place at the beginning of the, the new reigns, Alaric apparently hoped it would be promoted from a mere commander to the rank of general in one of the regular armies. He was denied the promotion, however. Among the Visigoths settled in um, Lower Mesia, uh, as we've seen now part of Bulgaria and Romania, and the situation was ripe for rebellion. They had suffered disproportionately great losses to the Frigidus, where 10,000 men Right, these are numbers that mean uh, really a lot in terms of demographic strength of the same people, and, and it's a, you know, uh, this means a, a much lower political um, bargaining power uh, within the within the empire. You know, think about the anomaly in itself of being with, within the empire at this point as an extraneous body that okay decides to play to the game according to the rules of Rome, but still being a problem that Rome could would would quite likely uh, get rid of, right? And according to this rumor, exposing the Visigoths in battle was a convenient way of weakening them, right? Uh, this combined with their post-battle rewards prompted them to r raise Alaric on a shield, according to Germanic uh, practice, and proclaim him king, right? And uh, according to Jordanus, uh, both the new king and his people decided rather to seek new kingdoms by their own work than to slumber in peaceful subjection, subjection to the rule of others. So this tells you pretty well um, the disappointment, right? Uh, the, here the, there was a, a contract that had been um, dishonored in some way, as of course the Romans were trying to, to get rid of the gods in a different way by exploiting their strength and you know making them suffer the highest losses in it. So at this point the, the, the gods were not uh, passive anymore and that's what led Alaric to be um, elected as a, as a new ruler right, uh, of the wall gothic group n s um, that had settled as we've seen from previously uh, quite um, uncoordinated groups in the, into, uh, into the Roman territory. And Alaric, as we have seen, struck first at the Eastern uh, Roman Empire. He marched to the neighborhood of Constantinople, but as many um, armies, uh, 
after him of finding himself unable to undertake a siege retracted his steps westward and mar then marched uh, southward through Thessaly and the unguarded pass of the Thermopylae in into Greece. The armies of the Eastern Empire were occupied with Hunnic incursors in Asia Minor and in Syria. Instead, Rufinus attempted to negotiate with Alaric in person. Mm? This is also particularly important. This is the moment in which the Huns are starting to become a problem. Um, and, and, and this means that you know the, the Eastern Roman authorities preferred to deal, of course, with the Germans and with the Huns. Because the Germans were already somewhat Roman. I mean, they, they knew the Empire, they were kind of willing to settle down, as we have seen. Um, and the, the Mongols weren't. Um, however, this only aroused suspicions in Constantinople that Rufinus was in, in league with the gods. But it was very interesting because now, with even Stilicho, as we've seen, would be uh, accused of that. Uh, and that's why Stilicho, ho however, himself now marched against uh, the East, against Alaric, right? After all, the two halves were still cooperating, kind of. And according to Clodion, Stilicho was in a position to destroy the gods when he was ordered by Arcadius, influenced by Rufinus himself, to, to leave Illyricum. Soon after, Rufinus' own soldiers hacked him to death. Power in Constantinople now passed to the eunuch Chamberlain Eutropius. Rufinus' death and Stilicho's departure gave now free rein to Alaric's movements. He ravaged Attica, but spared Athens, which capitulated at once to the, to the conqueror. Uh, in 396, he wiped out the last remnants of the mysteries at Eleusis in Attica. You know that the, this, uh, you know, there were these initiations held every day for the cult of Demeter and Persephone based on, uh, at Eleusis. Um, the, the, they were the most and uh, famous and secret religious rites of ancient uh, of ancient Greece, and, uh, and and this ended in fact this, the same um, ex exoteric ceremonies that had lasted since the Bronze Age, and then eventually Alaric penetrated into the Peloponnesus. Uh, Considered that he was an Arian, right, and so. This this fact that he was a Christian um, was important also in this. We will see it at the Battle of Polenzi, for example. You know, that, that there was a kind of mixed allegiance uh, to Christ and to the, the pagan beliefs. So uh, it's interesting. I mean, the, the Germanic pagan beliefs. So this um, um, the destruction of the mysteries of at Eleusis uh, are somewhat meaningful also in this legitimization, right? Because a Christian, at this point, the Eastern Roman Empire hadn't still um, tightened the grip on the on paganism. After all, it was a still kind of a fluid then situation, even if, it, even if the Roman Empire had become formally Christian, like officially Christian, but still, this, uh, you know, and therefore this could seem like a good opportunity to destroy something, you know, and plunder it, um, because it was pagan, even though he was just now a Germanic invader, crushing, like, with this this uh, local Hellenic um, communities. Um, so, Alaric penetrated eventually into Peloponnesus, he captured its most famous cities, of course, Corinth, Argos, and Sparta, and uh, selling many of their inhabitants into slavery. And here, however, um, Alaric's victorious career suffered, suffered a serious setback. In 397, Stilicho crossed the sea to Greece and succeeded in trapping the gods in the mountains of Pholoi, right, uh, on the borders of Elis and Arcadia uh, in, the, in the west of the peninsula, and, and from there Alaric escaped with difficulty, and not without some suspicion of connivance by Stilicho, who supposedly had again received orders to depart, right? Um, another si situation in which the, 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 the gods were bottled and could have been wiped out, and they, they were not. 
Um, and from there, Alaric is, um, let's say, uh, crossed the Gulf of Corinth and marched with the plunder of Greece northwards to Epirus. And here, his rampage continued until uh, the Eastern government appointed him Magister Militum Perilliricum, right? So, given him the fact that the, the Roman uh, command that he had desired, as well as the authority to resupply his men for the imperial arsenals, right? from the imperial arsenals and this was very important you know as magister militum uh, for illyricum he had uh, at his disposal now basically all the uh, all the province as also one of the most militarized ones of the time um, so he was th this was the way basically the east had coped with uh, his threat by not being able to stop him at least he con they compensated him with some official recognition without for, so that he could uh, he c he could stop uh, ravaging uh, and uh, just doing that at least in a more orderly fashion <laughs> in, in a less destructive fashion right uh, because obviously the empire thought um that th this peoples could be easily wiped out at one point uh, still and it was in probably in 401 that Alaric made, made his first invasion of Italy, originally with the intention to petition for a position closer to Rome. Um, so he wanted to carve for his own people a uh, space uh, in the west, right? He wanted land to settle in the west. And Alaric had a fascination for the golden age of Rome, as many other barbarian chieftains in and insisted on his tribesmen, as tribesmen calling him Alaricus, um, uh, which means king of all. Um, this great king meant in, in a kind of over lordly fashion, right? So just think about all the uh, various cultural currents, models of power, uh, and then both political and religious that flowed into the, these people's mind, these individuals' mind. I mean. Um, it, the, the the amazing feat of having marched on to Roman territory with this uh, even kind of mission of, of finding a space for your own people, which is not a few, right? Th this is what these Germanic chieftains had done all along. These guys came from the barbaric, and they they came from the uh, the wilderness. They they knew what it was like from the other side. Okay, it was a total wilderness, but I mean. Part of the gods, as we've seen, they came from the steppe. They came from very different worlds, if you want. Still aware of Rome, um, being aware how you know profitable it was to share its benefits, not destroying them, right? Um, and uh, supernatural influences were not lacking to urge him to this great great enterprise. For example, some lines of the Roman poet Claudian inform us that. Um, uh, Alaric heard a voice proceeding from a sacred grove. Break off all delays, Alaric. This very year thou shalt force the Alpine barrier of Italy. Thou shalt penetrate to the city. Right? But the prophecy was not to be fulfilled at this time. Uh, after spreading desolation through northern Italy and striding, striking terror into the citizens of Rome, Alaric was met by Stilico at Pollensia, in today's Piedmont. And the battle which followed on April the 6th, 402, coinciding with Easter, was a costly victory for Rome, but it effectively halted the gods' progress. Right. Uh, Stilico's enemies later reproached him for, for having gained his victory by taking impious advantage of Easter. Um, Alaric, too, was outwardly a Christian, as we've seen, though an Arian rather than, than a Catholic, and though he continued to practice the pagan rituals of his ancestors as well as observing um, ritual practices, uh, he also had trusted to sanctity of Easter for immunity from attack. Alaric's wife was reportedly taken prisoner after this battle. It is not unreasonable to suppose that he and his troops were hampered by the presence of large numbers of women and children, which gave uh, Alaric's invasion of Italy the character of a human migration. Hmm? Always bear it in mind, this, these were entire peoples on the march. Uh, right? They, these were 
uh, and think about the inherent risk of it and the real need, the real logistical need of not just thinking about uh, an army uh, that can live off the land, but you know, having children, women, old people together with you and uh, needing to find an accommodation for them and, and making them survive for, for your own people, you know, right? And after another uh, another defeat before Verona, uh, as we have seen, Alaric left Italy probably in 403, and he had not entered the city, but his invasion of Italy had produced important results. It even caused imperial residents to be transferred from Milan to Ravenna, hmm? and uh, necessitated the withdrawal of the 20th uh, legion from Britain, the uh, Valeria Victrix. These are the years in which, to which basically uh, Britain was to be completely abandoned by the Romans. Uh, so, talking about the second invasion of Italy, Alaric became the friend of, and ally of his uh, erstwhile opponent, Stilicho. By 407, the estrangement between the eastern and western courts had become so bitter that it threatened a civil war. Stilicho actually proposed using Alaric's troops to enforce Honorius' claim to the prefecture of Illyricum. The death of Arcadius in May 408 caused milder counsel to prevail in the western court, but Alaric, who had actually entered the Pyrrhus, demanded in a somewhat threatening manner that if he were thus suddenly requested to desist from war, he should be paid handsomely for what modern language would call the expenses of mobilization. mobilization. The, the sum which he named was a large one, 4,000 pounds of gold. Under strong pressure from Stilicho, the Roman Senate consented to promise, uh, to promise its payment. But three months later, Stilicho and the chief ministers of his party were treacherously slain on Honorius' orders. Uh, in the unrest that followed throughout Italy, the wives and children of the Federati were slain as well, as we've said before. Consequently, these three, um, three, uh, excuse me, 30,000 men flocked to Alaric's camp clamoring to be led against their cowardly enemies, and he accordingly uh, led them across the Julian Alps and in September 408 stood before the walls of Rome. Right Now with no capable general like Stilicho as a defender and began, uh, uh, Alaric began a strict blockade. Um, no blood was shed at this time. Alaric relied on hunger as his most powerful weapon. When the ambassadors of the Senate, entering for peace, tried to intimidate him with hints of what the despairing citizens may accomplish, he laughed and gave his celebrated answer: "The thicker the hay, the easier moved." Um, moved, and and after much bargaining, the, the famine-stricken citizens agreed to pay a ransom of five thousand pounds of gold, thirty thousand pounds of silver, four thousand silken tunics. 3,000 hides dyed scarlet and 3,000 pounds, pounds of pepper. And all, along came 40,000 freed Gothic slaves, right? Thus ended Alaric's first siege of Rome. The combined value of the gold and silver in pure coinage would have been worth 7,000 pounds in gold or um, 1 billion and 28 million solidity, enough to provide the basic needs of, of 200,000 adults and children for a year. Uh, and not enormous much of the role in this sense, or a keep 30,000 Roman infantry and cavalry, right? So you can imagine also what the expenses of the, uh, of the empire uh, were uh, in general. Throughout the, his career, Alaric's primary goal was not to undermine the empire, let's stress this, in, uh, let's stress this importantly, but to secure for himself a regular and recognized, uh, recognized position within the empire's borders. Um, Alaric's demands were certainly grand. The concession of a block of territory 200 miles long by uh, 150 wide between the Danube and the Gulf of Venice to be held probably in some terms of nominal dependence of the empire and the title of commander-in-chief of the imperial army. As uh, outrageous as his terms were, the emperor would have been well advised to grant them. Honorius, however, refused to see beyond his own safety, guaranteed 
by the dikes and marshes of Ravenne. As all attempts to conduct a satisfactory negotiation with his emperor failed, after instituting a second siege and blockade of Rome in 401, came to terms with the Senate. With their consent, he set up a rival emperor, the prefect of the city, a Greek named Priscus Attalus. Alaric cashiered his ineffectual puppet emperor after 11 months and again tried uh, to reopen negotiations with Honorius. These negotiations might have succeeded had it not been for the influence of another god, Cyrus. Uh, there was an anomaly. You know, that these were the, 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 the leading dynasty of the gods, which also Theodoric would, would stand. And, and therefore, hereditary enemy of Alaric in his house. Alaric, again, outwitted by an enemy's machinations, marched um, southward uh, and began his third siege of Rome. Apparently, defense was impossible. There, there are hints not well subst uh, substantiated of treachery. Surprise is a more likely explanation, but we, we can't. Uh, I, 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 I think it's actually not. Um, and I, and subs uh, th there are always, um, you know, different parties, let's say, different factions within cities that had reasons to open the gates to the invaders, right? And and th this happened historically to, to every in every situation. And however this may be for our information at this point of the story is meager, on August the twenty fourth, four hundred and ten, Alaric and his Visigoths burst in, in by the Porta Salaria in the north uh, on the northeast of the city. And Rome, uh, for so long victorious against its enemies, Roma Invicta, you know, was now at the mercy of its foreign conquerors. Uh, but it's interesting to notice that the contemporary ecclesiastics recorded with wonder many instances of the Visigoths' clemency. Christian churches savaged from ravage, prote protection granted to vast multitudes, both of pagans and Christians who took refuge therein. Vessels of gold and silver, which were found in a private dwelling, spared because they belonged to St. Peter. At least one case in which a beautiful Roman matron appealed, not in vain, to the better feelings of, of the Gothic soldier who attempted her to dishonor, right? Alaric was pretty harsh against anybody who attempted a rape, and that he would uh, punish his own warriors for that, and that should be given credit to. And, and but even these exceptional instances show that Rome was not entirely spared the uh, the horrors which usually accompanied the storming of a besieged city. And no, nonetheless, the written sources do not mention uh, do not mention damages wrought by fire, save the gardens of Sallust, which there situated close to the gate by which the gods had made their entrance. Nor is there any reason to attribute any extensive destruction of the buildings of the city to Alaric and his followers. The Basilica Emilia in the Roman Forum did burn down, uh, which perhaps can be attributed to Alaric. The archaeological evidence was provided by coins dating from 410 found melted in the floor. Um, Alaric, having penetrated the city, marched southwards into Calabria, he desired to have Africa, uh, as we've seen before, but which, thanks to its grain, had become the key uh, to holding Italy. But a storm battered his ships into pieces and many of his soldiers drowned. Alaric died soon after in Cosenza, probably of fever, and his body was, according to legion, buried under the riverbed of the Busento in, in accordance with the pagan practices of the Visigothic people. Scholars have wondered about the cause of King Alaric's death. Recently, uh, some uh, historians even, you know, claim to to have found the, out that the, the true cause of uh, Alaric's death was malaria. But you know, what what the hell does it mean? Even, you know, how do we know? It's likely, but come on, uh, and it's not even that important to be honest. And the stream was temporarily turned aside from its course while the grave was dug, wherein the Gothic chief and some of his most precious spoils were interred. 
When the work was finished, the river was turned back into its usual channel, and the captives by whose names and uh, by whose hands the labor had been accomplished were put to death, um, that no one might learn their secret. And a similar history, a story is told uh, of the Decebalus treasure, you know, buried under a river in uh, 106 A.D. You know, is uh, is a story told by uh, Cassius Dio concerning these events happening during the second century. And these burials repeat Scythian models from the Lower Danube and Black Sea as well. So this could actually reflect also the Eastern influences into Gothic. Uh, funeral practices, um, funeral practices, and it's uh, um, it's pretty meaningful, especially of peoples that were on the move, that and that, that uh, were used to you know to, to be also hampered by these uh, riches they had to hide in some way. You know, the migration era typically shows in many contexts all these. Um, situations in which uh, you know the, the the conquerors were arriving, or the, at least it was needed to to be moving, and the, the uh, treasures would be buried, right, and and just not uh, as a mean of uh, um, you know a, a practical reason, but also you know with some ideal attached even to 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 the places, to the sacred nature of this. Um, of these actions, etc. Uh, there was a great belief here between, you know, into still into pagan ideas of the uh, deities of the uh, of the underground and the the, the, and the skies. I mean, there was all of a deep um, religious perception of wh whichever um, event of life and uh, and death is as well, of course. Uh, Entailed, and Alaric was succeeded um, in the command of the Gothic army by his brother-in-law Ataulf, who also married Honorius' sister Galla Placidia three years later. Right? Um, the this leads us as to to see what the Goths did after it, you know, and how they established effectively the the, the Visigothic um, the Visigothic kingdom as a territorial entity which at this point as we've seen uh, it had not been right you know the gods had settled in trace in in, in the lyricum as well but uh, you know they were still a pretty unstable group and alaric had been uh, had brought them fundamentally elsewhere by the way i found particularly interesting when uh, the romans freed 4000 gothic slaves right and and this speaks of course for the the amount even of gods that had been um in fact um absorbed by the, the roman empire into roman society through through that way which suggests that uh, first of all how many they were because these are not small numbers but secondly how um the events of all these people had been substantially um, varied, you know, different, and they, they, we have seen the same Alaric didn't even uh, be, uh, wasn't even part, uh, I mean, he, he was still across the, the, you know, left bank of the Danube, uh, while uh, the, you know, the, the other gods had already passed, the ones of Adrianople, etc., so that is important to understand uh, the the complexity of this of these entities and naturally talking about the Visigothic kingdom implies to to look at this west and uh, what was happening in there um, and why and how the, the Visigoths managed to transition in fact from this um, semi nomadic population with a relatively few political cohesion at this point um, that had been exploited by the same Romans for for using the gods to their to their ends into a territorial entity with a political control over in fact large areas of the west um and the devolution of the uh, of the french uh, excuse me of the, <laughs> the french visigothic monarchy right um that would be very important into to western history up to the its destruction at, at the hand of, of the muslims in in the beginning of the 8th century so 
um, th there is this major event, probably you know about, from 407 to 409 AD. Th there was this uh, alliance of Germanic Vandals, Iranian Alans, and Germanic Suebi that crossed the frozen Rhine, sweeping across modern France into the Iberian Peninsula. For their part, the Visigoths, um, under Alaric, had sacked Rome, uh, capturing even Galla Placidia, the sister of Western Roman Emperor. Honorius, so th the West wasn't faring very well, right? And um, and, and the Visigoths were at this point the the most powerful of these entities in the West. Uh, the ones, however, they had uh, already a preferential channel of interaction with Rome, so that they were somewhat favored of the role. Um, they were definitely more Romanized than the Vandals, than the Alans, than the Suebi that had never been part of the Roman uh, Empire. Instead, they had been dwelling now for two generations into the empire, so even the Romans um, knew they they that the Visigoths were the referential uh, point for them um, in order to control them, even against our barbarians, which would happen, right? What is fascinating in this picture is how the gods didn't um, didn't um, didn't abandon the empire either. You know, they accepted the fact they were part of it, and albeit maintaining their own beliefs, their own identity, still uh, accepted. And, and there, w there weren't many other options, really, to be part of that world. Um, and and this obviously, you know, it's interesting, it could be... Uh, it, 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 it's not so anecdotal in the sense that other Germans didn't do that objectively, and they developed in turn another... Uh, mentality, another uh, attitude towards the empire. The Visigoths partly shared this. At the same time, they were some of the, f you know, most faithful allies of Rome. But obviously, with this ambiguity that would, that there was natural uh, in that situation that could not be overcome, um, of course. And uh, at this point, we we left with Athalf, right? There was. Um, um, brother in law to Alaric and king of the Visigoths, in fact, from Alaric's death in 410 to 415. Well, Atolf spent the next few years operating in the Gallic and Hispanic countrysides, right? diplomatically playing uh, competing factions of Germanic and Roman commanders against one another to skillful effect, and taking over cities such as Narbonne and Toulouse in 413. This is very important because it shows, first of all, that th the gods could were basically th the most powerful entity there that could uh, exploit the weaknesses of both uh, the Germ the other Germans and and the Romans. Uh, he managed to seize this very important, like actually the the most important uh, Roman cities in two southwestern Gaul, Narbonne and Toulouse, and some of the most. Um, a Romanized lands in absolute terms in the West, um, and also important centers on their own, like even as fortified centers, in particularly important um, trade routes and uh, um, the controlling the this uh, mountains that stretch basically from from the Pyrenees to 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 somewhat central France. So that 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 is um, those were the lands actually that um, they first settled in without being allowed by the emperors that as we will see actually would settle them into other territories now um, also uh, not that they left control of the previous ones but we, we can imagine this having happened in a somewhat regulated fashion after all right and always remember that at this point uh, the, the gods were playing an important part into western roman policy as Eventually, uh, Atolf married uh, Placidia, the emperor, uh, uh, and, and 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 the emperor Honorius enlisted him to provide Visigothic assistance in regaining nominal Roman control um, of Hispania from the Vandals, the Alans, and the Suebi that now had, in fact, entered into into the Iberian Peninsula. It was one of the most, um, one of the safest up to that point, actually. Roman provinces because it was far. Now, Gaul had been opened, and and this uh, 
barbarian populations were sweeping through uh, the, uh, the Roman territory. And um, this was very important because uh, together with southern Gaul, you know, the Iberian Peninsula was one of the most strategic, important strategic assets for for, for for the Western, for Ravenna at this point, for the Western uh, Roman Empire. And in 1418, Honorius rewarded his Vis Visigothic federates under King Valia, that reigned after Atalf from 415, 411, uh, excuse me, uh, nine, uh, 19, by giving them land in the Garonne Valley of Gallia Aquitania that is Aquitaine, on which to settle. This probably took place under the system of the Hospitalitas, hmm, that entailed the, um, uh, basically the concession of one-third of the land to the, uh, the, the, the Federati. Right? This happened in different ways. Um, usually it was a, a territory was carved out, uh, was, uh, you know, suitable enough for for this not not literally all the uh you know uh, one third of the property but you know there were expropriations of course and um and this was naturally uh, impacting also local communities so, so it wasn't an easy choice but it was still the best and, and still it was regulated uh, but we don't know whether how this really happened. You always have to think in this ambiguity in the middle, for which, yeah, these guys basically settled in one place. Uh, I mean, they weren't physically suspended in the air. So, so you know, where in another that they they occupied these areas, and then probably it was a formal sanction, or maybe uh, this uh, settlement was guided into uh, you know into towards other directions, was channeled towards other directions, but it was already happening by itself and it, it seems likely that at first the Visigoths were not given a large amount of land estates in the region uh, as previously believed telling the truth but that the, the they acquired the taxes of the region with the local Gallic aristocrats now paying their taxes to the Visigoths instead uh, of to the Roman government which is also a pretty sensible thing to do right you can find new land where to settle after all, this is a moment in which large territories were depopulated. Uh, the point, though, is maintaining uh, kind of a revenue. That is what these peoples, in fact, were were seeking for, either, the, either in form of tribute or taxes, the unknown or whatever, you know. And this is how it worked. The, the local aristocracy already ruled the, the local um, business and, and politics, so... Um, this was no no surprise, no no strange thing. Instead of paying to the Roman Empire that now was vanishing in the area, paying to these peoples that you know are now effectively ensuring, as long as they remain there, that no other people comes to to attack, and, and, and it, it's it's even profitable, right? Uh, it's not j uh, an imposition in absolute terms. You know, there is to profit from this as well, from the local side. And the Visigoths, with their capital at Toulouse, remained de facto independent and soon began expanding into Roman territory at the expense of the feeble Western Empire. Under Theodoric I, um, ruled uh, between 418 and 451, the Visigoths attacked Arles. Arles being, you know, in one of the most important, he had been the prefecture of Gauls into today's Provence in southeastern France. Uh, they attacked it twice in 425 and 430, and eventually also Narbonne, that they they had eventually uh, probably lost, if I'm not wrong, and, and this happened in 436. And however, at this point they were checked by Flavius Etius, who used Hunnic mercenaries like he had used uh, against the the Burgundians actually. Um, and, and King Theodoric was defeated by the Romans in 438. It, by 451, the situation had reversed. Paradoxically, it was the Huns now that had invaded Gaul, and now Theodoric fought under Etius famously at the battle uh, against Attila, 
uh, in the uh, on uh, at the Catalo uh, Catalonian plains uh, in northeastern Gaul, and Attila, as you know, was defeated um, and was driven back. Uh, however, Theodoric was killed in the battle. So this is this is important and fascinating because, first of all, it tells you how um, aware of an expert of military. Uh, business were the Visigoths at this point, uh, how well acquainted with the Romans and the Huns they, they were, settling into this uh, Gallic territory and having therefore reached a kind of degree of territorial control and fighting against, first of all for the Romans, then against the Romans, then again um, uh, for the Romans, against the Huns, in, in the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, they fought uh, uh, with the uh, with the Ostrogoths that were under Attila on the other side, and just think at all the mixed feelings. You know the fact that the Goths were there even in Gaul, it was because they had been escaping the hunt. So, the confrontation with uh, between Visigoths and Ostrogoths at this point is very fascinating. Two peoples that had had for different reasons, two different stories, but they were uh, from uh, from some generation, but they were originally you know part of the same uh, ethnic group, and it was quite quite meaningful with all the difference of, of the case. Um, at this point the Mandals uh, had completed the conquest of North Africa when they took Carthage on October the 19th, 439 and uh, the Suebi had taken most of Hispania. Uh, at this point the Roman Emperor Avitus uh, sent the Visigoths into Hispania. Theodoric II ruling between 453 and uh, 466, invaded and defeated the king of the Sueb at the Battle of Orbico, in, um, in fact, 456, um, and uh, near uh, Asturic, right, and he eventually um, defeated the Suebi kingdom, sacking their uh, capital, Braga, um, and um, the Goths um, sacked uh, also the cities in the rest of Spain quite brutally, to be honest. They, they massacred a portion of the population and even attacked some holy places, um, probably due to the clergy's support of the Suebi, which is pretty meaningful at the same time. Um, Theodoric took control over the Hispania Betica, that is the uh, essentially the, the southern one towards the Strait of Gibraltar, and the Carthaginensis, that is instead the, the, the coastal stripe in, in the east, with Carthago Nova, and, and also southern Lusitania, that is uh, today's southern Portugal, essentially. Well, the Suebi actually were existing in part in the north, like what is today's central and, and uh, northern Portugal on, on the coast of Iber. So, uh, in, in 461, the Goths also received the city of Narbonne um, from the Emperor Libius Severus in exchange for their support. This led, in parallel, to a revolt by the army and by uh, Gallo-Romans under Aegidius, and as a result, the Romans under Severus and the Visigoths fought other Roman troops, and the revolt ended only in 465. In 466, um, uh, uh, Eric, uh, um, was one of the most famous and successful Visigothic kings, who was also the youngest son of Theodoric I, came to the Visigothic throne. Right? He's kind of famous too for murder, having murdered his elder brother Theodoric II, who had himself become a king by murdering his elder brother Torismo. So, you know, pretty nice families, as you understand. And, um, but uh, it was really about this, you know, it was a struggle for the control of the clientele, so of, of the elites, and um, all these clashes now for us are kind of difficult to follow because aside from matters of time, but it's not that we know literally everything about this stuff, uh, the problem is, though, that we can't imagine the agitations that all this new settlement had entailed in one or another. I mean, um, the 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 establishment of the monarchy, the the, the fact the fact that surely within the Visigothic uh, elite it was a more conservative branch that didn't want uh, the, this to happen. Another that kind of 
recognize how viable the uh, you know the, the monarchic option and convenient could be for them as elite there were religious problems as well we've seen that um, that now the territorialization of the kingdom into Spain had brought to you know to control new um, people right um, there were also a lot of people like Spain was at the time one of the most uh, um, populated areas of the West um, still, at least, especially in the south, and uh, and and other peoples in the surroundings, like the Basques, uh, the Asturians, the the Suebi, that weren't actually very happy of the Visigoths being there. There were uh, religious policies as well. The problem of Roma uh, Romanization, the relation with local elites as well, it was a big deal for all Romano-Germanic kingdoms. 